everybody, recording live from somewhere, this is Zach Couples with episode number 26 of the Movement Debrief. And as always, we got one of the dopest ones you've ever seen, ever heard, and all that jazz. Yeah, Whew. tough car crowd today. Um, so we're going to talk about kyphosis, we're going to talk about, uh-oh... We got a poor connection. That's not good, but I'm going to keep going. So we're going to talk about kyphosis. We're going to talk about um, total hip arthroplasty. We're going to talk about, what do I mean when I say triplanar? What do I mean when all that jazz? And how do I treat these three planes? But first, some housekeeping. Did you guys see my blog this past week? What we talked about this time was I interviewed my boy, the doll. Randy Bowling, and we discussed all things travel physical therapy. We discussed a little bit of psychology, and I learned some interesting insights from the guy. So uh, you should check that out. Give it a shot. See if you liked today's post, or Monday's post, I should say. Otherwise, housekeeping, that's about it, my fam. You know, it's day before tea gives, so I'm excited about that. I'm going to go see. Uh, a, a brother who I haven't seen in a long time. You know, I uh, haven't. I've, I've met him only a handful of times, but he's good people. So we'll be in Vegas, and we got a hiking uh, trip planned over the weekend. So stay tuned. I'll keep you posted on that. Will this hike be the hike of the month? It's hard saying, but we'll find out. Otherwise, housekeeping wise, Human Matrix, the code for maximal health and performance, September. 15th and 16th of next year, that Friday and Saturday, that weekend, I keep getting the dates mixed up, darn it, you'd think I'd have it down pat. It is the 15th and 16th in Seattle, Washington. You guys should come check it out. We're going to talk about all types of cool stuff. We're going to talk about my approach. We're going to talk about not just the movement side of things, but hopefully a few other things. It is going to be off the heezy for sheezy. I want you there. And if you are there, we're going to hang, we're going to bro out, do all types of cool things. So be there, Human Matrix. Make it happen. Other than that, let's debrief, shall we? First question. I can't pronounce this guy's name because I don't know what it is because it is in characters of some sort. But a YouTube question. Which, by the way, people, if you are listening and you have questions, fire them away, right? Ask questions. That's what I'm here for. Debrief. That's why it's live in the studio in my beautiful travel library. John Imes would be uh, very jealous of this travel library, which if you guys have taken PRT, should you? Eh. Um, maybe. Eh, no. Nah, it's a neat parlor trick. But anyways, um, in all of his videos, he's got like this huge library. And so this is what I bring with me when I travel. Uh, a little bit of a pack rat. Neither here nor there. But uh, anyways, first question. The, the name is in character, so I'm sorry I didn't say your name. But this person asks, Hey Zach, I'd like to ask you what you do with someone who has a humpback. Since most sedentary people have an overflexed T-spine and compressed rib cage, I challenge that. Um, I think to help them achieve apical expansion could have a good influence on the ribs and T-spine. But does it have as much influence as I thought, so what would you do to these people? Whatever your name is, phenomenal question. First off, do most sedentary people have an overflexed T-spine and compressed rib cage? I would challenge that because I see a lot of individuals who actually have a flat thoracic spine and rib cage. And the, the key is location, location, location. You have to look at where are we getting kyphosis or not getting kyphosis in the thoracic spine. And if you look where you should normally have it, which, ooh, that would have been devastating, <laughs> Facebook. Dang, okay. Um, where it would possibly be, right, would be kind of the mid-thoracic region between the shoulder blades. We should see a little bit of kyphosis there and a little bit on the upper side of things. That's normal. Rarely do I see that. You see these shoulder blades hanging off, the rib cage, so on and so forth. In scapular winging fam, it's a lack of thoracic flexion. It's a lack of the... Uh, the, the rib cage going up against the concave scapula. Um, so a lot of people are 
actually have a decreased amount of thoracic flexion. So something to be mindful of. The point being with, with either of these cases, the process is, is very, very similar. Um, I'm, my very first place that I'm looking for is affecting the rib cage, and what do I do to assess that? Courtesy of Bill Hartman pushing me in this direction and educating me on this process, it's the infrasternal angle. When you do see someone who's got a true kyphosis, um, a lot of times, at least the way I, I process and think through this, you'll see a narrowing of the infrasternal angle and an external rotation of the rib cage. So this kind of happens. Why does that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked. So the reason why I think that that happens and we think that that happens is as the diaphragm descends, and let's say my wrists are the rib cage, as the diaphragm descends, you see how the rib cage kind of expands outward. Okay? Watch what happens when I continue to descend. Eventually the rib cage gets pulled inward. What this does is it allows the external oblique muscles to gain leverage at pulling the rib cage in this way. So you get a frontal plane pulling of the ribs this way. Now if you look at the um, fiber direction of the external obliques, when those muscles contract, it actually pulls the rib cage a little bit forward. Dana, how you doing, girl? So glad you're here. Um, but it pulls the rib cage forward, so it's going to kind of do this sort of thing, right? Now, fam, I don't want to be driven into further extension, so guess what might happen? I'm already here because my rib cage is narrowed. Well, I may want to get a little bit of flexion, so what can I do? Two things. I can contract rectus abdominis to pull the sternum down. Looks like I got a kyphosis, doesn't it? Because I do. Why? Because the rectus abdominis is trying to get me a little bit of flexion, trying to prevent me from going too far forward, so I'm going to do that. Another possibility. I'm pulled forward because of the narrow infrasternal angle. Could pitch my head forward, which could potentially give me a more of a, an increase in the upper thoracic kyphosis. Um, so you have a, a potential, a couple potential causes as to why someone might present with an increase in kyphosis. Now what's the treatment? Fix the angle. The infrasternal angle is how you can truly tell if someone, in my opinion, has, has the diaphragm in a good position or has it as a good zone of apposition. What we're looking for is not narrow, not wide, we want about 90 degrees. That gives the external obliques, internal obliques, transverse abdominis, a good amount of length tension, and happiness ensues. So a lot of times what I will do is I will get that first, and then I'm going to see what happens after that. Do I need to potentially do something to inhibit the pecs and get them back this way, which I'm not really doing much uh, thoracic extension. I don't emphasize that much with people, but could it be now that I think about it, another potential contributing factor to create kyphosis or fake kyphosis is maybe I just do that and I get the pecs, uh, pec major and pec minor pulling things forward like so and so maybe I have to do things to inhibit that and so let's let's break this down in a sequential fashion in terms of how I would treat. So narrow infrasternal angle these guys have overactive abdominals in most cases, so think rectus, think the external obliques are biased to compress things inward, but I have a descended diaphragm. So what I have to do in this case is I have to position myself in such a manner that I can pull the rib cage back to give the internal oblique and transverse of the abdominus a fighting chance to IR the ribs. IR and expand the rib cage. So we're here. I need to get here so the diaphragm can go here. So what I need to do in this case is, and this sounds counterintuitive, but to pull the rib cage back, I'm going to use that movement right there, serratus anterior, which helps retract the rib cage. But also, if you look at the attachment of the packs, which this was, again, 
Shout out to Bill Hartman for this one. This was kind of mind blowing. I got to write him down because he's going to be in the show notes, fam, as he should. Daddy O pops. Um, but when the rib cage is more wide in terms of, or has a larger anterior to posterior diameter, the pecs actually get leverage to ding the rib cage back. So those also help retract the rib cage. So lately, I've been way more Gucci about letting peeps feel their pecs when they're doing that reach. So what I do is I have them reach this way. What I don't want with that reach, maybe, maybe I'll slip into something more comfortable to explain this. So here's what I don't want when you reach. Okay, whether that's something in quadruped, whether that's a forward reach, whatever, doesn't matter. All right. Here's what I don't want. I don't want the sternum to do this. Why? Fam, I just told you, rectus abdominis. We don't want the rectus abdominis during this. So I want the sternum to stay parallel to whatever surface I'm facing. So if it's this wall I'm reaching, it stays parallel to the wall. If I'm on all fours, sternum stays parallel to the ground, and that's my reach. Then I'm getting tr true rib cage retraction and not a further reinforcement of the kyphosis. So I do that, and then my breathing. With these types of people, I don't want an excessive abdominal contraction. So I got a kind of sneak attack when I'm, when I'm doing my breathing in this case. Okay, so what you're gonna do is this. Silent inhale through the nose. Because if they're here, right, because of the increased kyphosis, <laughs> When I do something big, I'm going to get an increase in anterior neck musculature. That's going to keep me in that position. No go. So I want a silent inhale. I want you to think about Michael Myers is in the other room. If he hears you inhale, you're dead. So silent. The exhale. It's an open mouth, fogging up of the glass, long, slow exhale. I'll use fogging up the glass as an analogy. I used yawn today. That worked great because this guy, this guy, every time I tell him the fog up the glass, would be, homie, don't play that. So yawning, a uh, long sigh of relief, all of these things work. Dana, the cue I, I use to keep the sternum parallel is I simply tell them to keep the sternum parallel. Most people seem to get that. Um, or I'll show them what I just showed you. So. I say, I don't want that, you're doing that. I want this. And if it doesn't work in the activity that you choose, pick a different position, they might get it then. Supine could potentially even work as well because it's very hard to do thoracic flexion in the supine position. Where was I? Oh, okay, so the exhale. <sighs> Fogging up glass, long, slow, controlled, so I don't get further overactivity of the abdominals. Then, the pause, P-A-U-S-E, five seconds, longer even, because I need to give the diaphragm time to dome, one, two, you stay in that pause state, it helps reset pH balance a little bit, because in individuals who are potentially overbreathers or hyperventilatory, they could be a little bit more, yeah, I see you, Lily. It, it could be a little bit more on the alkaline type state, uh, whether that's uh, an uncompensated or compensated respiratory alkalosis. So you let CO2 build up, that can drop pH down, life is good. So pause, another silent, effortless inhale, like Michael Myers is in the next room, and repeat. You do that, recheck the infrasternal angle, and you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at how fast that can change. Uh, I mean, we, we think that this rib cage is this fixed thing, that's bull-ish, fam. Uh, this stuff moves, and it moves very, very quickly. So that's my, my first first line of defense when dealing with um, thoracic kyphosis or, or someone who's presenting kyphotic. So if you got that normalized and they still look like that or whatever, you know, um, not that I care much about, well, I do care about how I look. I mean, this ain't sexy, fam. Let's get it twisted. Um, what I might do next then is I'll probably look at the shoulders. 
And so if I have someone who is pitching forward like this, what I may see is I may see limitations in shoulder internal rotation. If it's more scapular positioning involved, um, could potentially see limitations in um, horizontal abduction. Um, you could potentially see limitations in, in, in shoulder e extension. It's another thing to look at that's actually pretty important because all this is kind of pulled forward and I just can't bring things back. So if that's the case, then I need to do something to retract. Okay. Now I'm not doing this because I don't want to lose the infrasternal angle. I'm simply going to do something that engages the lower trap. So hang on, Jordan asks, fam, <laughs> I love it. If in supine the head wants to pop up into flexion, would that be too much RA as well? Yes, I would say in this case, yes, yes. At this stage, I am, so what Jordan asked on Instagram, Instagram baby, is if they're doing some type of reach in supine and the head comes up, likely crunching, likely reinforcing kyphosis. I don't want that yet. I may want that later though, right? Like if I'm coaching them to do a Turkish getup or something like that, that might be more than appropriate. Um, but in this early phase when we're resetting or normalizing the infrasternal angle, I don't necessarily want that. It's a great question, Jordan. Also a mentee, that's just mentee city here. You guys rock. Okay, um, where was I? Okay, so um, addressing position of scapula, I'm gonna go after a low trap of some sort. I need something to retract the shoulder blade back without driving too much thoracic extension without losing rib cage position. Just a simple something like that. I don't care what you use. It doesn't matter. Um, just do something that gets that and changes your tests. Um, I found that both of those, that, that sequential uh, piece of inter intervening in such that manner works pretty well. And so those would kind of be my bullet points in that regard. What if it's passive cervical flexion, Gerard? Um, hang on, sorry. And a comfort position. That's a good question, man. So if you, um, that was a good, so Gerard on Instagram, baby, asks, what if when the head comes up, it's, it's because of passive cervical flexion? So I, I'm thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gerard, you're, you're saying that that individual is so kyphotic that their head just kind of sits there anyways and they can't go back like this, which I've had a few of those people. In that case, there's likely been pillow. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, Gerard, that's exactly what I would do, is I would put a pillow underneath that. Because there's some people who have likely undergone some structural adaptations at the thoracic spine that ain't going to fix the, the, the turtle head kind of thing. And so what do I do? A compensatory strategy. And, and a pillow is a compensatory strategy in this case. So let let their head be forward for those people. Um, so I agree with you 100%, Gerard. So here's how we do it. So once we've addressed the infrasternal angle, once we've addressed shoulder positioning, that seems to be good. We still got some issues with the head position. Maybe that's the driver of something that's that's going forward. Um, what I will do, I won't necessarily retract back because um, that seems to reduce lordosis, which I don't necessarily want. I need to actually get a restoration of lordosis, which sounds a little bit counterintuitive. Because they're already here, I don't want them like this, right? Well, it's because of the kyphosis position, right? So what I will do in, in that case is maybe I will do some activities that involve a, a roll underneath the neck, have them in a little bit of cervical extension, maybe working some type of rotational activities. Um, those types of things are, are some of the things that I'm doing right now to restore that um, cervical positioning. So um, that's kind of the sequential process when, when treating kyphosis. So you address ribcage first and foremost because a lot of this is ribcage driven. Still got problems. Look at the shoulders. They still have problems. Go after the neck. And in that order, I like reaches with long, slow, effortless exhales. I like getting low traps to retract the, the scapula back to give me just an appropriate amount of thoracic extension, not too much, but an appropriate amount. 
And then the last thing I will do is I will address neck position by restoring lordosis. So whatever your name is, man, I really hope to um, learn how to speak these characters one day. Um, but that was a great question. So thank you. Next question. Lucy. Lucy is a wonderful person. Lucy Hendricks. I'm going to link that chick. Yo, you, you, Lucy, you already have like a link in the show notes because I know I was going to link to you. Lucy and I collaborate together on a lot of people um, with and with her uh, BF, BF, uh, Dave Wilton. Um, those people of uh, Enhancing Life in Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky. If you're looking for good trainers, that's who they is. So uh, check them out. Lucy asked a really good question. Actually, a few questions. Someone with a, uh, uh, I'm seeing someone with a recent hip replacement, three months. Uh, they're, they've finished PT and cleared to do everything. And I'm going to run through each question and we'll just answer them as we're going like this. So the first question that Lucy asked, so overall theme is post-rehab total hip arthroplasty. Okay, so things to consider in the assessment. Will I get false negatives? So um, generally, the first thing I will say, Lucy, and everyone else who's listening. Oh, hey, Zach, how do you increase shoulder flexion? Um, Gerard, I'll answer that after I answer this question. Okay. Um, all right, so, all right, where was I? Total hip. Things to consider in the assessment. Will I get false negatives? Here, that's a, that's actually a really good question, Lucy. Because anytime you alter structure, um, things are going to be different. I don't know how that's going to be different, but things will be different. And I've really seen the gamut. So I've seen some people after a total hip arthroplasty who, and it would be interesting to see what they what how they presented. Um, after the fact, or I should say before the fact, but you'll see some people who are incredibly limited in multiple directions, and that's probably a contributing factor as to why they had the total hip replacement. You know, if I uh, if I lack variability at a joint, you get overloading at the joint surfaces, problems ensue, and so some of that may still remain. That's one thing, but I've seen the other side too, where you have someone who's incredibly loosey goosey. So you have excessive variability at a given joint, and what happens? Rely on the passive elements for stability, joint surfaces wear and tear, and you need a total hip. And so I don't think you would necessarily see anything that would trick you. Um, it, it's likely to be idiosyncratic, and it likely depends on which side. Um, I, I mean, the, the capsular pattern of the hip, and this, you, you know, this hasn't been well validated in the literature, but generally we would say internal rotation is limited, first and foremost. But like I said, I have seen some people who internal rotation was clean, right off the gates. And this will tie into the next question or the, the following question. But you you treat these people, regardless of this this total hip, very much the same. You know if. If they don't have motion restored at the hip, which, you know, as I as I hate to say, a lot of times after PT that that is the case, um, you you would do the exact same things you would normally do for anyone else. Get them sagittal plane, so make sure they have hip flexion, hip extension. Get them frontal plane, make sure they can adduct all the way and abduct all the way, and then get them transverse and restore rotation. Now, sometimes if they've had um, you know, structural adaptations for a long period of time, and maybe they've undergone some adaptive shortening in some way, shape, or form, you might not get full motion back. Um, and, and, you know, I, uh, I go back and forth on the low, low, long duration stretching. Uh, I just haven't seen it work. And I don't know if it's because I haven't done it long enough or I didn't pick the right person to do it with or what have you. I just don't know. Um, and even with, with 
with people who I'm seeing like with shoulders as an example if you have an adhesive capsulitis or something along those lines it's like if you address axial skeleton and and the appendages in, in an adequate fashion a lot of times that takes care of things but maybe maybe if there's some structural changes undergone you're just not going to change that and so you do the best you can treating things the way you would normally treat them and make compensatory adaptations as needed and so you know if I have someone who can't IR the the hip maybe I avoid positions that put them into a lot of hip internal rotation as an example if I have someone who can't externally rotate maybe I don't do a super wide front squat with them as an example um, so just modify accordingly but I, I don't think you'll see anything funky things to consider on the training floor so and, and this this is actually this is kind of a lot of things things to consider on the training floor things I should focus on and what should I stay clear of one thing you want to be mindful of are the precautions that that individual has undergone and so pending what approach was done with the total hip arthroplasty there's certain movements you want to avoid. Now, let me admit, um, these could potentially change and are likely idiosyncratic to the surgeon, but as a general overarching recommendation, if they got a scar across the posterior aspect, so they got this long scar on the butt, that was a posterior approach. Um, Dana, I will. Dana asked another good question. Hang on one second. Circle rotation to restore load dish. This okay. To restore lower doses. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so precautions. If I had a posterior approach, so the scars on the back side of the rear, here's what you don't want to do. <laughs> you don't want to hyperflex them, hyper adduct them, and then IR. Why? Because that is the exact same movement that the surgeon did to pop the hip out. Or actually, it makes this noise. Something like that. Um, it's loud. It's pretty cool. So, activities that you would do that involve this, I, I really don't know. I generally think, especially at this stage in the game, that you can probably do the individual movement so you can get someone fully flexed. You could probably IR someone safely. You can even adduct them. Like, I ain't afraid to, to, to test hip adduction whatsoever on people who've had a total hip. Um, it's just the combined motions that you get a little bit concerned with. And I even wonder if those are a concern because I think a lot of times in these cases from what I, and again, if, if I'm an error or anyone, please, please correct me. Um, but a lot of the research is kind of, yeah, in terms of if these precautions even matter, it might just, you know, either bad genetics bad tissues or bad surgery and not necessarily the precautions I don't know um, if I'm wrong please let me know but um, yeah you don't want to put them in that position so deep squats yeah you probably should be careful if I have someone who's got like an anterior lateral approach I don't want to do combined adduction external rotation and extension and so uh, again, those individual movements are probably okay, but you know maybe I'm careful on split squats and, and things like that when the the the, the surgical leg is is um, is on the backside. So those would be things to consider. Just be mindful of combining those movements. And so just to review that, posterior is flexion, a deduction, internal rotation. Pop it out that way. Anterior, anterior lateral is extension, a deduction, and external rotation. So I'm popping it out the front, right? Uh, think about it like, uh, you know, a patho hip. How do I make a hip patho anterior? In that case, I, I do that movement. So, or actually, that, that's actually a great way. I've never even thought of it that way. Um, think about when I'm going to loosen the ligaments in the anterior posterior aspect. What movements would that be? Um, perform those movements right then you got problems so be careful of those things to things to focus on 
If I have someone who has an approach based on its anterior posterior, I may want to provide some ligamentous muscular reinforcement in those regions. And so if I had someone who has an anterior lateral approach, right, they've had some trauma that way, maybe what I want to do is work some of the muscles that would support the anterior structures of the hip. And so that could be an anterior glute mean, that could be a, um, an adductor magnus, could even argue possibly for the hip flexors. Um, you know, anything that crosses the anterior aspect of the joint, we want that because that would reinforce the area that was traumatized from the essential dislocation necessary to perform the procedure. If I have a posterior approach, then I'm thinking glutes, right? I want to get more of a, a, a glute max and the, the posterior rotators and the posterior glute max to reinforce the posterior aspect of the hip. Especially important for people um, dang, James answered a well, never mind. I'll have to ask, answer that later. Um, but uh, so yeah, if a, if it's a posterior approach, all the posterior hip muscles are incredibly important. Um, not just to reinforce where the dislocation occurred, but they're often cut through in this surgery, and so you have to do things to uh, improve and, and, and reinforce that area. And so think about emphasizing those areas from a variability restoration standpoint. Otherwise, honestly, you treat them just like you would anyone else um, in the training floor. So, you know, respect those potential contraindications, but do the things that they need to do to, to get successful. So at, at whatever their goals are. So don't be afraid to squat them. Don't be afraid to deadlift. Don't be afraid to do split squats. Don't be afraid to do step ups, all those things. I mean, there really is no restrictions. You just want to make sure that they have, especially when there's been a surgery, that the, the basic constituents, the, the, the movement variability of joint range of motion, um, you know, active and passive control in three planes, you want to make sure that that's there just so you can protect the area as best as possible. And then just have them get after it. Um, you know, you might want to be mindful of some plyometric based activity in the lower extremities, but you know, I've seen Daddy O Pops who's who's had the surgery do jumps, so I really don't think that that's even off limits at this point. Um, so I just you you treat them as you would anyone else. Just be mindful of potentially putting them in excessively compromised positions based on their surgical procedure. And otherwise, Lucy, have them get after it. So that's my spiel on total hip. Good question, Lucy. Um, now, Gerard asked, how do you increase shoulder flexion? Um, good question, Gerard. Same process, honestly, with, with the kyphosis, because a lot of times you might see a limitation in shoulder flexion because of that. So I'm going after infrasternal angle one. Um, sometimes, uh oh, we lost Facebook. So just give me a minute. There we go. Facebook's back. So uh, going after, I know, sorry, we're working on getting the internet back. Don't be upset. You didn't miss anything. So uh, shoulder flexion, restore infrasternal angle. Um, you may want to check intercostal mobility. And the way I look at that is I seated trunk rotation. The intercostal muscles are trunk rotators. And so think of the intercostals as this way. They either do, if this is the rib cage, they either close it together or they either open it apart. So if, no Lucy, thank you, great question. So they either close it together or open it apart. And so if I can't rotate to the, the left, in this case my left, it may be that these guys are so closed down that it doesn't allow for rotation to occur. Right? So what do I need to do? Well, I need to open that space up. And you may see the same thing with the limitation of shoulder flexion. For me to go completely overhead, these intercostals have to be able to open up. And you can see that on both a wide and narrow infrasternal angle. And so what I will do is activities that open up the intercostals. And what could that be? Some type of overhead-based reach where I'm keeping the, the um, 
obliques engaged on that side and I'm doing some type of stretch that way. That could be one potential thing. Uh, I also restoring scapular position and a lot of times lately at least I've been I've been chasing flexion last because a lot of times if you clean up external and internal rotation by whatever means you choose um, and a lot of times for me that's either driving the scapula into further protraction or retraction um, that will clean up a lot of shoulder flexion if that's still limited after you've done all those things then I'm going after some activities that work on um, potentially lat and and, uh, and and pec mobility or extensibility and so maybe that's soft tissue, maybe that's different stretches or activities that will work on getting those guys to let go. Um, those are all potential ways to treat someone or improve shoulder flexion. So to summarize that, good question. Um, still infrasternal angle. You still do things. To, you you do things to address the rib cage. So check intercostals. That would be two. Um, address scapular position, then go shoulder, in that order. And uh, you know whatever methods you you have at your disposal, use them. It doesn't you know I'm not whatever works. You know, the the big thing that you have to do is are you getting the outcome you want? And that's how I sequentially go about getting that outcome. So, Gerard, good question. Dana asked a clarification question. Clarif can't talk today. Clarification question. Zach, can you explain cervical rotation to restore lordosis? Yes, I can. It's all about these guys. Sternocleidomastoids. So, hey, respect it, don't neglect it, Gerard. These guys pull forward, right? I need to be able to get the SCMs to chill out. That's the key. Now, the SCMs are obviously rotators. I get that. But when I go this direction and this SCM kicks in, this SCM has to relax. And then the flip side, right? If I turn to the left, this SCM kicks in, this one relaxes. And so you can do rotational base activities to get, instead of bilateral activity of the SCMs, more unilateral activity of those SCMs, more as a phasic muscle than necessarily a tonic positional based muscle. And so that's why I would go after rotation and you could potentially throw side bending in the mix as well since these muscles are triplanar in action of the, the cervical spine once I've gotten them into a position where they can appreciate some lordosis. And so that would be why, Dana, I would go after rotation with these people. So um, that was a good clarification question, but make sure you got lordosis restored first. Okay, last question. Unless someone else has a question. I ain't got nothing to do. Actually, I do have things to do, but it's more, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm working on putting down some content for you people. So, um, Ori asked this one. Zach, you have talked multiple times Referencing gaining sagittal plane first and moving on to frontal and I guess transverse plane next. You are absolutely right, Ori. Can you explain more what you mean by this? Can you give an example of how you would assess if they have sagittal plane and how you go about treating it and progressing it to the other planes? Thanks. It's a great question, Ori. So what do I mean? Um, and and part of the reason why I haven't gone into detail on this previously is because Everyone has treats differently. Everyone assesses differently. All these types of things, and you know, I don't know if if what I do has has all the answers. It helps a lot of people that I do, but I'm constantly refining and tweaking what I what I do in my assessment, and you know, constantly asking myself, does this matter? Is there a better way that I can do this that's more reliable? Um, so. Uh, that's why I probably haven't gone into detail because I, I I think the principle of working in this fashion is is important, um, but not necessarily is the method the 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 driving factor because really the big key is the outcome. 
I don't care what you do, you know, I don't care if you throw peanut butter across the room and say a seance, if it changes what you're looking to have changed, cool, fine by me, you know, kind of, you know, you probably should do things that have some biological plausibility, but neither here nor there, I mean, if that's what fixes them, cool, do it. But how do I look at things? Um, sagittal plane. How do I know if someone has the sagittal plane? That was the first part of this. I look at just about every joint in the human body and I ask myself, do they possess sagittal plane mobility at all those joints? So do they have shoulder flexion? Do they have hip flexion? Do they have a straight leg raise? Do they have hip extension? Do they have knee flexion extension? All of these areas. I look at a lot of them. I spend most of my time, just for, for brevity's sake, looking at the axial skeleton and, and things along that. So, you know, for example, if someone has low back pain, I might not look at knee flexion and extension. Just because I don't, it, it's not, at that stage in the game, it's not a big factor for decision making. Someone who had a knee surgery, I'm absolutely looking at knee flexion and extension. But I have to ask myself, do they have sagittal plane at all of those important joints? And how do I go about treating that or restoring sagittal plane? It's pretty simple, to me at least. I ask myself this question. What can't they do? And how do I get them to do that? Let me give an example. Let's say I have someone who lacks hip extension. Well, what muscles can I improve upon to help drive hip extension in this case? Well, at the hip joint itself, you have glutes and hamstrings, right? Those muscles extend the hip. And so I might select an activity that involves those two muscles. Now, I want to ensure that I'm not getting lumbar extension as well. And so what I may do instead is, well, not instead, but along with those guys, I may get an anchor upstairs from my abdominals to, to ensure that I get a full excursion of, of true hip extension. And if you do some type of isometric contraction or concentric, it really, I mean, the activity doesn't matter. But if you do some activities that enforce those guys working together in that fashion, a lot of times you can restore hip extension. So that's how I would do sagittal plane. Frontal plane, it's the same process. I'm looking at all of the joints in the human body that have frontal plane motion. And so shoulder abduction, hip adduction, or hip abduction, ankle inversion, eversion, etc., etc. I'm checking all of these joints and I'm applying the same process. For example, let's look at hip. Let's say I have a limitation in hip adduction with however you test it. I don't think it really matters. You just have to test that movement. Um, what I might do, based on what we know could limit hip adduction, which, you know, if you look at the study in anatomic investigation of the Olbers test, because that's how I test it, um, what got the improvements in movement, I'll link that in the show notes. I just got to write that down. What got an improvement in movement was not cutting the IT band, but cutting the gluteus medius and the posterior capsule of the hip. And so, what do I do? Well, I use an activity that reciprocally inhibits that or that drives that adduction movement. So if I have a limitation adduction, I'm going after adductors to put the hip in that position. Or if I have a limitation in inversion or eversion. If it's inversion, I'm doing things that involve the inverters and maybe other things that could summate that. Think like your, your PNF principles, right? So an eversion is probably an easier example, but hang on. D2, is it? Wait, 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 wait. I think it's D1. Yes, D1 extension. So that movement there. If I want to get an increase in eversion, I can get concomitant 
hip abduction activity, so gluteus medius, to get kind of a summation effect, to have both of those guys work at the same time. And a lot of times, if you have someone who's limited in eversion, working those two guys together can impact motion at the ankle to a very high degree. And that is evidence-based. At least I can, I can, I can work, work that through my mind that that's effective. And the reason why I can is this study. I'll link it in the show notes because I don't remember the name. Um, it's like Jimmy and CAI. But uh, I've linked it in the past. If you have someone who's sustained an ankle sprain and you look at hip functioning, the, the gluteal muscles, in particular the gluteus medius, has re reduced activity. And so what can I do to, one, protect the ankle, but two, also fix that, right? So ankle sprains, inversion. I drive eversion, so I'm using everters, but I'm also doing an activity that kicks it in the glute med. And so activities such as that might be useful in restoring frontal plane movements. And so that would be a, you know, a couple examples of what I might do for someone with a frontal plane limitation. Last is transverse. So what's the testing? Transverse plane motions at all the joints. How do I treat it? Same process. I got someone who is limited in hip IR, I need to stretch or get the external rotators to relax. And so think about doing things that address the posterior hip. After I've cleared axial and, and axial structures and maybe I have a local appendicular problem, let's say the shoulder, I mean it'll be the same principle. Maybe, maybe, sometimes you do have to do this, although I find it very, very rare. Um, maybe you have to stretch the posterior shoulder in a, in a manner that's safe, whether it's a posterior glide or whether that's using the subscap to drive the, the humerus into IR. Um, really, the possibilities are endless. Um, so that's kind of how I go about my process. I, I, I try to keep this very, very individualized to whatever the needs are of the individual, and you really have to... I, to me, it's important to look at as many joints as you possibly can because a lot of times you'll see similar limitations present in multiple areas. For example, like the limitation in eversion and limitation in hip abduction. Um, I've seen that quite a few times. Someone who can't flex their knee and they also lack hip extension you know, because of the quads being overactive. Um, but if you look at more and more joints, you can you can then start to combine movements and get kind of a summative effect if that makes sense um, and, and that can be incredibly helpful so um, that's kind of how my thought process goes when I'm looking at addressing these individuals in that sequential fashion so sagittal plane frontal plane transverse just look at the joint range of motion and then use the muscles involved to drive them into motions that they can't do. And so that's pretty much it. Um, and I think that's all I got for tonight. Let's say anyone else has any questions. No? Okay. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. Um, this was fun, especially when I know it's wait, Blackout Wednesday. Is that what they call it? <laughs> How square did I just sound right now, fam? Like, I don't know why you guys even talk to me. But... Uh, yes, Blackout Wednesday is, I believe, what it was called. But that was from back in the day. I don't really do that much anymore. So um, thank you guys for hanging out with me tonight. I hope you all have a wonderful hashtag tea gives. Um, yeah, and I'm sure you guys are wondering, Zach, where can I find out more? Lily, thank you for being here. Um, if you want to learn more, first off, go to ZachCouples.com. That's my website. There's all types of cool things for online services such as movement consultations like I do with the lovely Lucy. Hang on, wait, wait, wait. Dan. Silence. I'm going to keep going, fam. Because Dan on, um, on YouTube asked a wonderful question. Dan. Zach, can you explain how to differentiate between rib versus T-spine movement in the sagittal plane? I understand T-spine extension can decrease the ZOA but can this be exclusive from any pelvic influence? Let me think about that. That's a good question. So 
Uh, can you explain how to differentiate between rib versus T-spine movement in the sagittal plane? I understand how T-spine extension can decrease the ZOA. That's a good question, um, Dan. So Dan asked, how can you differentiate rib and T-spine movement in the sagittal plane? Honestly, I would look at the infrasternal angle and the zone of, if, if the zone of apposition could be maintained because I can theoretically, if I get my abs and get a zone, I can I can extend the thoracic spine to some degree, right? It's actually that's really tough. I can definitely flex more, um, and, and a lot, I, I'm sure you know that's a lot of head movement. But but we have to understand that the the ribs and the thoracic spine often move together, and there's not really much independent movement that I think we can create that doesn't involve the rib cage moving. Um, so that's what I would say about that. And can that be exclusive from any pelvic influence? Yeah, it, I, I, I think it can occur. Um, well, obviously, you know, if you move the rib cage or the thoracic spine, that may potentially influence length tension relationships at the um, pelvis because you have many muscles, you know, you have your erectors, you have your lats that attach at both those areas. Um, but, but, but can it occur exclusively? Yeah, I, I, I think so. You know, I, I've seen some individuals, and I'm probably a good example of that, who move very, very well pelvic-wise. Hey. And, uh, but, but suck at the thorax. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I do think that you, you can have that independent factors going on in both areas so I I wouldn't rule that out but you know a lot of times usually you don't see that one you, you don't see that in someone unless they're incredibly good movers for whatever reason whether it's their sport or whether they've done some some stuff ahead of time so um, to kind of summarize that question Dan um, can you differentiate movement yes but if you lock the rib cage it's very hard for the t-spine to move doesn't move much. I don't think there's a way you can move the T-spine independently of the, or uh, the rib cage independently of the T-spine though, because obviously those joints attach at one another. So that would be my my thought right now, based on what you asked um, regarding that question. So Dan, great question. All right. Other than that, guys, well, we're approaching an hour. So where can you find me? Go to zackcouples.com. Check out the online services page. I offer movement consultations, and I pair with some trainers like the lovely Lucy Hendricks, who is in here. Um, my boy Dave Rasco, I'll link him, Andy McCloy. Those are my peeps. Uh, we, we work together and collaborate on a lot of people. If you want to be a part of that, you know, come come give me a call. And I also worked with uh, Trevor Lassar, too, out of uh, Portland. Um, I'll link them. That was a new one. Um, good people. Um yeah, so um, I do that, but obviously you don't need a trainer. I've worked with a lot of people who don't have someone performing assessments along with them. So if you aren't moving as well as you'd like to, maybe you toy to something, and uh, or maybe you've done PT a few times and it hasn't worked, and you want some kind of fresh approach where someone addresses your movement capabilities of everything. Not that it's online PT, uh, but but go ahead and check that out. I also offer mentoring, and a lot of the mentees today ask some really good questions. So if you want to be a part of that process, um, you can come check that out. We work through all types of different things, whether it's movement variability, power capacity, professional advices. I mean, it really can be the gamut of anything. Um, even if you just need someone to bounce ideas off of, I can be that guy because I know it's hard to find good mentors. So go ahead and check that out. Also offer some fitness training online as well if you want programming maybe you know you're post rehab and you want to do something to help you get after it I can help you with that I can help you with athletic performance kind of things based on some of my past experiences in the league I can help you with fat loss because uh, you know I've done it a few times and uh, I've done it for other people as well so um, if you want online training check it out once you've done scouring or once you've scoured zackcouples.com before you leave, sign up for the newsletter and get a free, free, free acute chronic workload calculator. You'll get access to my talks I'm going to be putting out. And uh, if I don't beat myself up too much, 
I'm going to record a talk and it should be out for newsletter peeps only in December. And it might be very early, so stay tuned. All right? So sign up for the newsletter. Otherwise, you can find me on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Z Couples or forward slash Zach Couples PT, which is my professional page. Yes, this is unprofessional right here, fam. So check me out on Facebook. You can find me on the Instagram, baby. Instagram.com forward slash Zach, Z A C Couples. You can also find me on Twitter. My handle is Z Couples. And last but not least, you can find me on YouTube. Just search that couples. I got like a bazillion videos out there. A thousand people subscribed. A thousand plus, actually. I'm very excited about that. So those are all the places you can find me. Unless you're in Page America, then you can come find me here. And we can go hang out, um, go hiking, and eat some incredibly average food. Other than that, you beautiful, sexy people, have a wonderful tea, Gibbs. Thank you so much for being here. Keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces!